Good evening. I'm Dr. Sarah Ferguson, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and on behalf of Texas Lutheran University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this keynote session of the 2021-22 Crow Symposium, Multilingualism Matters. This year's symposium continues what is now a 41-year tradition of assembling scholars, policymakers, community leaders, and others to discuss relevant and important issues of our time. Past Crow Symposium topics range from music in the brain to nuclear war to healthcare, from the theological concepts of suffering and salvation to connecting with comics, and from Central American immigration to creativity. Consider the university's premier academic event this annual symposium is a central component of TLU's Prost Life Enrichment Program, which was established in 1977 to foster the intellectual, social, physical, and spiritual development of TLU students and the broader community. And now, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Liliana Guerrero, Assistant Professor of Music and the Director of Vocal Studies. Thank you. I will be singing a piece for you in German today. This piece is called Zweignung, or Dedication, composed by Richard Strauss. In this piece, poet Hermann von Gilm expresses his undying devotion for his beloved. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero, for that lovely piece of music. One of the founding fathers of the Crost Life Enrichment Program and the Crost Symposium was Dr. Frank Giesberg, professor, professor emeritus of economics who served Texas Lutheran as academic dean when the idea of the Crost Program and Symposium became reality. Dr. Giesberg, who died in 2016, is somewhat of a legendary figure at TLU known for deep connections to this place, his intellect, his sense of service, and as one colleague has said, his abiding devotion to the life of the mind. In recognition of Dr. Giesberg and his contributions to the establishment and ongoing support of the Crows program, the keynote presentation of each Crows symposium is now titled The Frank Giesberg Lecture. In just a moment, Dr. Beth Woods will introduce you to the distinguished speaker who will deliver this year's Giesberg le Lecture. First, let's show our appreciation to these faculty and staff, organizers of this year's symposium. Dr. Beth Woods, Planning Committee Chair, Dr. Reza Amasian, Dr. Ari Devia, Dr. Danielle Grove, Professor Donna Cabana, Jonathan Zegelman, and Ashley Ford.
I also want to acknowledge the underwriting support of TLU's Brown Endowment Fund for Cultural Enrichment for this symposium. Established in 2009 by the late Mrs. Jessie Schultz Brown, a Texas Lutheran graduate, and her husband, Dr. J Jack H. U. Brown, this fund makes it possible to bring to this stage prominent individuals to present the Giesberg Lecture at each Crow Symposium. Now please welcome to the stage Dr. Beth Woods, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Chair of the Planning Committee for this year's symposium to introduce your keynote speaker for tonight. both from the academic side, the media side, as well as uh, what I've been able to do in my career uh, as someone who is really passionate about foreign languages. And in addition, I'm going to try to instill you with uh, some of my general thoughts about the value of language learning and, uh, broadly speaking, just how cool and fascinating languages can be as a tool for human communication or uh, just as a kind of system on their own to study. So without further ado, and pardon the somewhat cliched title, but I thought it was cute. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so uh, our plan of attack today is going to be fourfold, and I promise I'll get you out of here all on time. 
Uh, so first, I want to start out with a little pop quiz uh, about how much you know about world languages. Second, I'll give you a uh, brief and painless background about me, so uh, my experience with languages, with media, and whatever this bizarre word polyglot means. I know we have a professor of uh, ancient Greek over here, so perhaps he can help us out a bit. Uh, third, I'm going to talk through some tips and tricks that have been crucial to me as a language learner. Uh, of course, we actually experimented with these a fair amount today with a number of you I see in the audience and trying to do a short Mandarin lesson over the course of an hour and a half. I was pretty happy with what we came up with by the end. And uh, fourth, and most importantly, is our conclusion here, right? So, so what? Why do languages matter? Why does multilingualism matter? And I hope we'll come to a concrete answer by the end. So, uh, without further ado, so how many of you can speak a foreign language if you just want to raise a hand? OK, well, self-selected crowd. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, so it seems like about half the crowd, perhaps a little bit more, has experience with a foreign language, which you might or might not know, is uh, somewhere actually above the US average. So it's no secret, obviously, that in the United States, uh, we are very much behind the rest of the world when it comes to bilingualism and uh, second language acquisition and foreign language cap capabilities uh, in general, right? So as we can see from the map here, there's a relatively small percentage of students in the United States in the K-12 level that are actively enrolled in language courses. Additionally, as we can see here, uh, there are pretty significant disparities between states, right? So some uh, more developed, wealthier, and more urban states on the East Coast have much higher levels of language enrollment in schools compared to more rural areas of the country. And just to put that data into more perspective, again, we see that there are some pretty dramatic discrepancies in the numbers. So New Jersey coming out ahead of the rest of the country at 51%, New Mexico coming in at only 9%. But even overall, compare that then to levels of language enrollment and language capability in European countries, and the difference is stark, right? I was somewhat surprised by this data that Romania was first. Um, but as you can see here, most of these are countries uh, you could guess just off the bat would have much higher levels of language enrollment, right? France, Scandinavian countries, Germany. I certainly know every time I travel to Europe and I try speaking a foreign language, whether it's Dutch, Swedish, German, what else, the moment they hear the hint of an accent, they switch it to English, right? It is almost uh, an entirely Anglophone continent in many ways. But of course, there's also heavy levels of language enrollment in other regional languages in Europe, right? People uh, very actively study French and German all over the continent. So this raises an obvious question, right? Why the gap? So the United States, as the largest economy in the world, uh, should have the resources and the human capital to have much higher levels of language education than the rest of the world should. So we have an obvious question here. Why is it that we're falling behind so dramatically? So I have a couple hypotheses. I'd be very interested to know what you all have to say, perhaps during the Q&A session. But some things that immediately come to mind. Uh, first is a bit of an accident of geography, right? As a continent that... Uh, rather as a country that uh, was founded primarily by English speakers who enforced their language both on the indigenous population and on people that were coming into the country as immigrants, um, we've had uh, a kind of monopolizing force in the linguistic sphere that has pushed us all into being English speakers. But if you look around the world, you'll actually find that our situation is pretty uncommon. So no matter where you go, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, in East Asia, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, even in uh, communities in Latin America, multilingualism, if not just bilingualism, uh, is in fact uh, the standard. So just some examples here to give you the sense of geography that exists. Uh, India has approximately 447 languages. That obviously will depend a bit on what your definition of a language is versus a dialect, which can quite often be a political question. But uh, again, it's not uncommon for a person just growing up, living in uh, a small community, to have to know multiple languages, either because they have parents that are multilingual or because they have to learn one language in school, one language in their town, perhaps one language in the next town over. Uh, so it's really not that uncommon to find people from places like India, like Nigeria, uh, who have grown up quadrilingual, pentalingual, if that's a word. Um, and you see it as well to the most kind of dramatic showing uh, the island of Papua New Guinea, which by some estimates has uh, cl close to 840 languages. Uh, so again, this is, you know, obviously might have its drawbacks on a social level, right? There are plenty of issues of communication. There are plenty of issues at the level of political centralization. But the sheer level of language diversity that's on display is honestly astounding and should put our uh, situation into some stark perspective. 
Uh, so another obvious one that might explain for the gap in uh, American language proficiency is uh, deliberate policy choices as well. So uh, of course, it's been no secret over the course of the United States history that the US government and private actors as well have tried to suppress and exterminate the languages of indigenous communities. Uh, this was actually uh, almost a national policy. It came in the form of the movement of Indian children to boarding schools where they were forced to speak English and beaten for speaking their native languages. Uh, additionally, especially in the World War I era and afterwards, there was a very heavy sense of American nationalism which actively tried to get rid of languages that were not English in the public sphere. So by some estimates, for example, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, over 30% of our country was actually uh, German-speaking in terms of their first language. That continued on, and there were plenty of communities, some of which, uh, in fact, still exist in, in Texas uh, with some elderly speakers that were primarily German-speaking. But when it came to World War I, this newfound sense of uh, nationalism and patriotism uh, went a long way towards wiping out that level of linguistic diversity uh, at the social level as well as at the educational and political level. Uh, as well, you might imagine that in the United States, for any number of reasons, languages are seen uh, in the educational sphere as uh, something that probably is more uh, easy to put on the chopping block than uh, topics such as math or uh, science or other uh, things that are seen as crucial for children to have when they're entering the global economy. So it happens quite often that when there are budget cuts, uh, it's often languages that are uh, the first ones that are, you know, that are put on the chopping block. A uh, third one, this one's a little bit more speculative, um, but it's the question of need. Uh, and this could be measured in any number of ways, but if you look at the, the statistics, they don't lie, right? Uh, essentially, the majority of the European population has uh, an intermediate to a high level of capability in English, which means that, quite simply, uh, as an American, it's easy to go abroad and only be able to speak English and only be, need to communicate in English. Same thing comes in the business sphere. Uh, you also have uh, the fact that uh, the United States uh, is one of, is rather, the world's largest economy, and uh, basically speaking English gives you access to this market, and for many people, that's all you need, right? Uh, and all these economies nearby, they also are learning English in order to do business with us. Uh, and then the third, and this is one I always find interesting, is that, so if you look at the numbers um, of uh, native language speakers worldwide, Chinese is, by and large, uh, the most spoken language in the world when it comes to first language speakers. Uh, however, if you look at the uh, distribution of those languages in the online sphere, English makes up the disproportionate majority of all language-based text on the web. So there's the other reality that as we spend more and more time on the internet, uh, our internet world is not reflective of the actual language situation in the world uh, at a day-to-day -day level. So in fact, Again, if you're on the computer all day, you probably only need English, and you can get everything you're looking to get out of the internet. <clears throat> so that, I hope, paints a bit of a picture of where we are as a society and where our policy choices have brought us, where our world economy has brought us, which is to a situation where, in the United States, for any number of reasons, uh, we have chosen to prioritize English and to deprioritize second language education. So for a bit of my background here, um, I'd like to think that I buck this trend, uh, but um, uh, it seems like many of you in the audience as well have a passion for foreign language education, at least I certainly heard it from all of you at dinner tonight, and you also have uh, very strong language abilities. So hopefully you'll see a bit of yourselves in this presentation, but I'm just going to walk you through briefly uh, where I am coming from broadly. So um, I don't love using this term, but uh, this was what was sort of thrown on me uh, when I was first featured in media outlets as a high schooler for speaking many languages. I got stuck with this uh, kind of ugly phrase, uh, polyglot. Sounds a little bit like a severe disease. Um, thankfully, it's not, as far as I know. Uh, instead, it's just a very complicated way of saying someone who is multilingual, right, from these two beautiful roots in Greek. Uh, and put in plain English, it just means someone who speaks a lot of languages. So for my background, um, not sure how well you can see this, but uh, I come from New York City, which has one of the highest concentrations of linguistic diversity in the world. Um, depending on how you measure it, there are over 1,200 languages that are represented in the five boroughs of New York. And growing up here, I had the opportunity, essentially, to get on the subway for five minutes and find anyone that I wanted to speak to. You want to find a Zulu speaker, you can find one right around the corner from a coffee shop where everyone speaks Hindi and a bookstore where everyone speaks Mandarin and uh, any number of bodegas and restaurants where you find people that speak Spanish, indigenous Mexican languages, 
uh, Japanese, Korean, really anything that you can imagine. And so uh, these are just two um, kind of close-ups of uh, neighborhoods in New York. Jackson Heights has one of the largest concentrations of linguistic diversity from South Asia, from the Indian subcontinent. Up here is uptown Manhattan and a bit of the Bronx, again, where there's massive concentrations not only of Spanish and indigenous Mexican languages, but also languages from Africa, um, Arabic, from uh, a number of other locations, basically. So as a high schooler, I was extremely passionate about learning foreign languages, learning bits and pieces of foreign cultures, hopping on the subway and going to neighborhoods and just trying to talk to people. And quite often, it was often uh, a <laughs> somewhat embarrassing experience if you can only mutter your way through a handful of words. But what I found each time I did this was that, uh, you know, people were thrilled to speak with me. At least once they found out I wasn't from the IRS, then they were <laughs> all ears. Um, you know, I, I used to take weekends, plot out a trip to five or six different places. I'd go in and speak Arabic in one place, try and practice Persian in another, Mandarin in another, and uh, it was sort of a confidence-building maneuver, and it also taught me uh, bits and pieces of everyday language. So it wasn't just the words that I was learning on a page, but instead real, authentic speech. And it was the closest thing I could get, basically, to language immersion. And that really taught me that when you move outside of the classroom, there's any number of strategies that are open to you to learn a foreign language. You don't just have to look into a textbook and find, okay, these are the five words for colors in French, let's just recite them 20 times until we can memorize them. These kind of boring, old-fashioned, very 20th century ways of learning don't have to be the single case. So uh, this started out basically just as a little side hobby for me when I was uh, between the ages of about 12 and 15, 16. Uh, and then that uh, led me to start putting together a YouTube channel. So I started this when I was about 14 years old, uh, and it was just an opportunity for me, basically, to start reciting monologues on the computer, sometimes chat with people, and try and show off or practice what I knew. Uh, many of these, it's just kind of bizarre to look at now, because I look like a baby. <laughs> But, um, you know, I'd study language for a month, I'd try and come up with a couple things to say, put on a camera, and I wasn't really sure where they would end up. But when I found, especially on doing less commonly taught languages, like Arabic, like Indonesian, the response was immediate, and it was overwhelmingly positive, right? I'd have people writing in, that's the first time I've heard an American speaking Arabic, or, wow, your Swahili's pretty good for someone who's only studied a month. They would also give me plenty of feedback, and I found that just by putting up these videos, I created a bit of a language learning community all for myself that buttressed what I was doing on my everyday walking around the streets of New York. Um, and for a little bit of context here, I guess what had got me the most attention was a video of me speaking 20 languages in one take from when I was about 16. Um, and that ultimately led me uh, to be featured in the New York Times uh, in this article, Adventures of a Teenage Polyglot, which uh, basically introduced me to the wider world, gave me lots of opportunities to go onto media outlets with these awful glasses and whatever was kind of going on from a fashion perspective there. You know, we all do dumb things when we're 16, they get caught online for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, but this, this story basically blew up, right? So I was featured in a Google documentary over here that had about 11 million views. I was on the Today Show, I was featured in The Economist, a uh, TED Talk that went viral, uh, as well as in foreign media, like this uh, piece of news in Iran. Um, and what I realized, I think at least, was that the interest in the story was not only the fact that there were many languages on display and many of them were obscure, but it was also the fact that this is quite uncommon for Americans. What I was hoping to do and communicate with the story is that there's no reason it needs to be. We all have the resources, even if we don't live in a big urban area, to study languages. Maybe you're not going to study 20 or 30 at one time. I certainly hope you don't, because I can barely do it these days. <laughs> but uh, you do have the chance and the resources at your fingertips to do really anything out there. So for a little bit about where languages have taken me in the business market, uh, I know this might be of interest to many of you, especially that are graduating or that are trying to understand where you can go as, let's say, uh, a bilingual Spanish speaker or someone who's taking Mandarin on the side. Um, I've had a bit of a topsy-turvy career since I graduated college, so uh, I first ended up at a language learning company called Fluent Worlds, which I think Beth mentioned in her introduction here, uh, driving business development and uh, uh, basically client relations. So in the end, again, I came in with pretty limited experience, and within two years I was negotiating contracts for 
uh, large uh, customers on our platform that were, had upwards of half a million to a million accounts. And that really gave me an opportunity to try and see how languages uh, not only can be reflected in the digital world, you know, in terms of uh, pedagogy and designing your own app and trying to communicate the ways you learn to other people, but also how it can lead you directly into the business world and uh, hopefully give you a, a little bit of experience and guidance there. Uh, on top of that, I soon uh, pivoted my career into the political analysis space. So I ended up going to grad school for international relations with a special uh, sort of specialty on the foreign policy of Iran, which is a country, country I've been fascinated with since I was a kid, still am, absolutely. Um, and some of the work I was doing there also involved doing political risk uh, in the business sphere. So trying to understand, for example, by reading foreign language media outlets, how uh, certain events happening in places like the Middle East or East Asia might affect markets, might affect insurance policies, might affect your ability to do business abroad. Um, from there also, I spent a fair amount of time just as a hobby on the side studying ancient, whoops, studying ancient languages. Anyone know what this is? Any hints, any ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, I absolutely love this stuff. So you're spot on. Um, this is a language called Sumerian. It's written in a, a script called cuneiform. So this is some of the earliest writing systems in the world, some of them going back to 3500, even 4000 BC in some instances, uh, and with little styluses that were directly pressed into clay. So this is the first recorded instances of human language that we know about from modern day Iraq. And that's what I did essentially all through college and as a side hobby afterwards, trying to understand a little bit more about how dead languages work and what they can tell us about the ancient world. Uh, separately, in my current job that I'm in, I work as a, uh, an open source uh, researcher, primarily in the national security sphere. And what most of my job involves these days is using language skills to track international illicit networks. So basically, how could you leverage things like uh, media coverage, like uh, corporate records, uh, foreign uh, you know, newspapers or academic publications or whatever it might be to understand how criminal networks uh, operate, essentially. And uh, at the company that I'm at, it's called C4ADS, uh, we've had a fair amount of success recently in cutting down into, um, for example, uh, wildlife trafficking, parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is a story that featured us in the New York Times last year in which we were able to identify smuggling networks that were bringing in uh, oil and other kinds of goods to North Korea. Um, so again, it's been a, a kind of whirlwind of different uh, career tours, but what I hope that can show basically is that you know, your language skills don't necessarily have to force you onto a single path. Um, quite the opposite, in fact, uh, you know, they open up an entirely new world to you. So in reality, I don't think I could have gone through any of these jobs without the experience and the interest I had in foreign cultures and foreign languages. Okay, and so for the bit of a fun part now, uh, I guess the obvious question here is why, right? Why get into this in the first place? Uh, what's the point? What's your takeaway? So besides the fact that I just think languages are very cool, uh, the thing that I think is most valuable about language is that it serves as a window into societies, cultures, and histories. So as a bit of a pop quiz here, um, can anyone name these three animals? Go on. All right, we're going to mumble our way through it. <laughs> Cow, pig, sheep. Easy enough. But when you cut them up and put them on the table, what are they called? Or what's this kind of meat called? Mutton, right? Beef, pork, and mutton. So if you know anything about language history, you might realize that the names of all of these animals are Germanic. They come from, ultimately, Anglo-Saxon, which is the Germanic language that was spoken in England before the Norman Conquest in 1066. And uh, all of those names have stuck with us today, right? Cow, pig, and lamb, or sheep. But what you find though, is that when you cut them up and put them on the table, all those words become French immediately, right? Pork is a French word, beef is a French word, mutton is a French word. And that's a clear reflection, just in the words themselves, of the social dynamics of England in the Middle Ages. Right, so the poor people who were taking care of the animals in the barn were primarily the Germanic-speaking underclass. The people that could afford meat and could have it on their table were all the French-speaking aristocrats who would come in. So again, just there in a handful of words, you can actually get an amazing view into uh, the history of our language and the societies that our language came out of. So again, there's plenty of other ways of um, using word histories or just the shape of languages to get a better view into uh, culture and history. 
right? So as an obvious one here, just in our example, uh, in the example of the United States, uh, we can see that the majority of our uh, state names actually come from Native American languages. And if you look down into the county level, there are quite literally thousands of Native American words that are preserved in our geography. So every day we are walking through areas that reflect the linguistic situation of the United States before colonization. Uh, similarly, what you can also find, if you know a little bit about how linguistics works, is that uh, many languages worldwide are ultimately connected back to an ancestor called Proto-Indo-European. So if you've ever been interested about why, for example, we have our word tu in English and dos in Spanish, duo in Latin, dva in Russian, right? All these words would sound similar. It's not an accident. It's because they ultimately all came from a shared source. And using some very smart techniques in historical reconstruction, we can also get a picture of what that original language looked like and a bit of a window into the culture of the community that ultimately created the language that then turned into Spanish in one direction, Russian in another, Sanskrit, Latin, etc which can give us some amazing insights into, among other things, for example, how ancient mythologies of the Norse or the Greeks are actually connected back to mythologies of peoples from ancient Iran and India. Um, again, just in the shape of words, we can see these international connections and histories that are right there on the page. Another thing that I've always found fascinating from a linguistic perspective is the life cycle of loanwords, right? So here on the left are three Arabic words um, which are originally Semitic, Right? They came from Arabic speakers, so khabar is news, qamus is a dictionary, and dunya is the word for world. What we find, though, is that this word is, and many others, of course, are popping up all over the world in different language families. Right? So in Swahili, we have habari kamusi dunya, in Persian, we have khabar qamus dunya, and then in Indonesian, again, khabar kamus dunya. So the point here is that these are pretty simple, everyday words that have traveled from Arabia all the way to East Africa, to Iran and Central Asia, and all the way into Southeast Asia, bordering on, on Papua New Guinea. That essentially, just in these words alone, we can actually see a little bit of the history of the spread of religions, of trade, of ideologies, and of conquest. Again, just with words on the page. So another thing that's always fascinated and motivated me as a language learner is just the sheer puzzle that language can present to you. And of course, one of the best examples of this comes in the scripts that languages are written in, which are a source of endless fascination for me, but for many language learners as well, can be a bit of a headache. Um, so out of interest, do any of you, can any of you recognize what's on the screen here? So perhaps these ones? No? Mandarin, right? How about above it? Japanese, how about here? This is a bit of a tough one. So this is uh, actually the script of the ancient Maya from Mexico and Central America. It's written in a bit of a hieroglyphic uh, script. Uh, here also you can see their number system. Uh, so how about up here, any ideas? This is the Arabic script. Down here is Sanskrit from ancient India. This is Georgian from the Caucasus. This says Wikipedia. Uh, and over here, again, is some more cuneiform. This one's actually from the Code of Hammurabi, which has this kind of famous first line up here, so, if a man should accuse another man of witchcraft but can't prove it, he shall be put to death. <laughs> Which is a um, pretty good eye and window into uh, ancient Near Eastern views of justice. But what I've always found so fascinating about these different systems are just the different ways that humans can conceptualize putting words on a page. So if you know anything about uh, Mandarin, you'll know that this is a logographic system, which means that essentially every word is assigned its own character. It's not phonetic. It's not spelled out the way that we have our 26 letters in the alphabet. Instead, essentially, you have to memorize and know how to write and recognize uh, several thousand characters just to be able to have a basic level of literacy. On the other hand, in Japan, they actually took Chinese characters and turned them into what's called a syllabary, where each of these signs stands for a vowel or a consonant with a vowel afterwards. So right here we have ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, sa, shi, su, se, so, etc. The Maya had a similar system to what's used in modern day Chinese. Georgian instead has an alphabet, much like ours. Uh, in Sanskrit, you have uh, a basic uh, consonant will always be followed by an A sound unless something else is written. Uh, in Arabic, we have primarily consonants. So for example, uh, this word here is spelled ta, da, ch, la, but it's pronounced as tadkhul. So all those vowels, you just basically have to know them when you read the word, or else you're not pronouncing it correctly. 
So again, the sheer amount of diversity on offer here, I think personally, is fascinating as a, as a bit of a puzzle and is a beautiful uh, picture of what human beings are capable of and their different perspectives on how to represent their language. Or not. <laughs> okay. Um, so that doesn't just stop, though, at the level of um, words on the page, but it also comes down to the way languages are structured. The more you study world languages, the more you see the amount of diversity out there is truly mind-blowing. So uh, some examples here, I always love talking a bit about these. There are some languages that have uh, words at the end of verbs which indicate how a person knows the thing that they're talking about. So in this languages, language, which was previously spoken on the Great Plains in the US, they have uh, a word, pabek, which means to burn, but if you say pabekinke, it means something burned because I felt a direct fire on my skin. If you say pabekine, it means, oh, it burned uh, because I saw a little bit of ash over there. If you have pabekle, it means, well, it burned because everybody knows they burned, of course. And then finally, pabeka means something burned because I have directly seen the fire, right? So they actually have to embed into their verbs how they know things about the world, how they know that certain actions have occurred, and their reflections on whether or not that's a real event. And that's an entirely different way of conceptualizing events than what we're used to in English or language like Spanish. Um, separately, one of the things that fascinates me to no end in languages is the sheer amount of diversity that can come with sounds that come out of the mouth, right? So you might think that French is hard with r or Germans, you know, have to suffer through saying ch, but uh, there are languages around the world, like this one, uh, Uber, which is from the Caucasus, it went extinct about 30 years ago, which had 84 consonants. So you can imagine little Uber babies had to say things like k, 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 and then k, 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 k. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> Similarly, there are languages out there that don't even use sounds that are produced uh, at the back of the throat like that, but actually do clicks, right? So actually, Nelson Mandela's first language, which is called Isi Osa, has the sound, right? So their number six, for example, is Si Enge. Their word for a church is Awa. Uh, the word for a mango is Anakanda. The word for a doctor, Anambile, etc. There are some really cool things that languages can do. Uh, on top of that, what also fascinates me is the sheer diversity that comes with the order of words. So, for example, if we want to say the sentence in English, I'd like to try on a suit I've seen in a shop across the street from our hotel. In Turkish, that comes out as otelimizin karşısındaki dükkanda gördüm bir elbiseyi denemek istedim, which literally is from our hotel across the street in a shop, the I saw it suit to try on, I want. So you have to reverse everything basically one for one. And it's not just Turkish, right? It's languages like Korean, uh, Japanese, uh, Navajo, I believe, and plenty of others that basically makes you invert your way of seeing things and thinking through what you're saying. You know, separately, there's some words that I just find have absolutely uh, uh, fascinating pronunciations. This one here, again, Georgian from the Caucasus, has a real phrase, uh, which means you all peel us something like that. Kind of a bizarre phrase, but idea is that some people really can do this kind of mouth gymnastics and use it every day in their conversations the way that we do when we're just saying things like hello. Um, and, you know, separately, another thing that always fascinates me as a puzzle in languages is uh, just the ability to be able to communicate, right? Even if it's saying something as basic as I love you, having in your head the ability to say that in Swedish and Spanish and Mandarin, etc., is, is not only a really cool party trick, which it absolutely is, uh, but it's also a very rewarding mental activity, and I think I'm gonna try at least to communicate that further on as we go through this. Okay, separately, and the last thing I wanna leave on in this section is that I view language as a key tool for human connection and for growth, right? Language not only gives you an opportunity just to communicate with people in the most utilitarian of ways, but it also really gives you a chance to understand foreign mindsets and cultures. And I'm talking well beyond just oh, the curious you know, oddities of the way the sentence is structured or all these sounds that are coming out of your mouth, but really at the level of trying to understand foreign mindsets and how people can think differently from you, whether that's accessed through you know, interpersonal relationships, whether it's done through uh, literature, through movies, or through any other number of uh, mediums, which, again, we'll be returning to in a bit. Okay. So what I assume many of you might be here for, again, is uh, to understand a little bit about uh, my process. You know, uh, 
how do you learn languages, right? It's something that the United States in general, if you've been through the US public school system or even the private school system, you really might not have had a great experience. Uh, and again, this obviously gets a little bit tough because which language you're studying, oh, shoot, I guess my, well, it doesn't matter. I had cute little emojis here, but looks like they disappeared. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> So many of the strategies that you're going to need to use for learning foreign languages will depend on the difficulty of that language as it compares to English. So according to the US government, there are broadly four categories of language learning, or, or languages to learn, uh, which uh, have four very distinct levels of difficulty. So in category one, at least according to the, the government, uh, is languages like uh, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, for some reason Swedish. It's primarily languages that uh, come from the Romance family, or at least Germanic family. And uh, they're also languages that have an enormous amount of shared vocabulary with ours because of our common history. So that, you know, even if you don't know the language super well, you could probably guess what a certain word means just by pronouncing it slightly differently and turning it into English. Category two, on the other hand, are languages that are much more complicated grammatically or might be from an entirely different family. So the big ones here are German, Indonesian, uh, Haitian Creole, among others. Category three, these get into sort of harder category, are the vast majority of world languages. So it's things like Russian, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Kyrgyz, Hmong, um, uh, Guarani, et cetera. There's literally hundreds of them in here. And this is approximately the, the sort of average difficulty of language um, for world languages that at least the United States government uh, <clears throat> sees for English speakers. Category four, as you might expect, is East Asian languages. So Korean, Japanese, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, as well as Arabic. So languages that are structured so dramatically different from English and that also have quite dramatically different writing systems, as well as systems like tones, as in Mandarin, that uh, you're going to need an enormous amount of time in the classroom to really master. So I'm saying this only because understanding the difficulty of your language compared to English is inevitably going to inform the strategies that you pursue to learn it, right? You know, presumably, the strategies you have for learning Spanish are going to be a little bit different for Japanese. Other thing you have to consider here, obviously, are your motivations, right? Not everybody learns languages for the same reason. So if you, for example, are trying to become a linguistic anthropologist, your uh, linguistic abilities and your motivations are going to be quite different from, for example, someone who's just interested in scanning through a newspaper or someone who really likes uh, anime, right? So this movie here, Sento Chiru no Kami Kakushi, Spirited Away. Uh, one of the first movies I tried and failed to watch in Japanese. But again, if that's your motivation, then it's going to be quite different than, for example, someone also who is moving abroad and needs to know just the basics for ordering in a restaurant or surviving in a hospital or whatever else it is. So with all of those caveats in order, uh, here are some of the things that I found most effective as a self-taught language learner. Okay. So the first one is integrating language into your daily routine and daily life so that it doesn't feel like a chore. Instead, you have language that's being passively thrown at you basically every point over the course of the day. So that can include, for example, the, movie, the movies that you watch, the music that you listen to, the social media feeds that you're on. Uh, what I find basically <laughs> is that every activity, especially online that I do, I try to have at least some foreign language involved in it so that I am basically passively absorbing it almost 24-7. And it doesn't feel like a task where I have to sit down and study. It's just, look, I'm going to spend four hours on Twitter. It'd be kind of cool if some of it came by in Arabic. Maybe I'll recognize a word or two and I'll remember it later on. So just as some examples here, right? There's any number of podcasts that you can listen to on your commute, on your run, on <laughs> whatever it is, that will start teaching you little bits and pieces of language. Separately, uh, as we did today in our Mandarin class, one of the most effective strategies I found for language learning is memorizing song lyrics, right? You might not realize it, but uh, getting a song stuck in your head, as annoying as it can be, is also an extremely effective way of picking up foreign vocabulary. You're not trying to memorize it. Instead, it's all just embedding itself in your head like a bit of a worm. And suddenly you find, oh, there's actually 50 words in Chinese that I know just from listening to this annoying song on repeat. And suddenly you have a word bank that you can then play around with in your head, rearrange a bit, and turn into real sentences, real speech that you produce. Uh, you know, similarly, I find, look, if you really like kind of junky soap operas and TV shows, there's no reason you can't do that in a foreign language. The reality is there is no shortage of this stuff in basically any language you're interested in, Middle Eastern languages, Spanish, 
Portuguese, Mandarin. Trust me, it's a universal thing to want to watch trashy TV or even just melodramatic TV. There is something out there for everyone. Again, even if it's 30 minutes a day, you're absorbing a huge amount of language that you might not even realize. You know, separately, as I said, I like to have my Twitter feed arranged into certain languages, and anytime on Wikipedia, the very first thing I do is see what languages a certain page is available in. So as one here, for anyone, you can read Arabic script. Um, when I first came here, the very first thing I did when Beth invited me was look up Texas Lutheran University. Now, I should talk to your marketing team, because it's actually only available in one other language, so you're doing yourself a disservice. It's available uh, in Urdu, which unfortunately here just says Texas Lutheran University. Not really a foreign word, but at the very least, it gives you a little bit of practice and should show you it, uh, at the very least that uh, there's plenty that you can do when you're scrolling through Wikipedia or any other news article that can help give you a little bit of passive language practice. Okay, another one that I found extremely useful over the course of learning is something that's called uh, a memory palace. Basic idea here is that you're moving uh, memorization of vocabulary and words away from something that's just on a page. So here are my 10 colors in French. Let's see how many of them I can spit back after you know, beating them into my head. Instead, what you try to do is integrate uh, foreign vocabulary or foreign phrases into your spatial memory. The way you do that, essentially, is to imagine yourself walking through a physical location that you know quite well, whether it's, you know, for me at least, it was this spot in New York, a subway spot that I took to go to school every day in high school, but it can be anything. It could be this conference room, your bedroom, anything in your mind that is a physical space that has a number of unique points in it. So what I try to do uh, over the course of building a memory palace is to walk myself through that space in my mind and turn each space over the course of that walk into a foreign word. So specifically, what I have here, essentially, is uh, walking down, this is Union Square in New York, as I'm walking down here, which was my walk to the subway every morning, I associated it with the Japanese word iku, which is to go, right? I'd be going, I'd be rushing, etc. As I was walking by the steps over here, I would think of the word suaru, to sit. Similarly, uh, going over here to a fountain, I would think of the word nomu, to drink. Trees over here, kiru, to cut. Back there at my favorite uh, bookstore was uh, yomu, to read. A uh, favorite restaurant of mine over here, I would think of the word taberu, to eat. Uh, over here, where there were plenty of people playing chess and talking, was the word hanasu, to talk. Uh, separately, kau, to buy, with plenty of stores in this area. And then finally, the subway itself, noru, which means to ride. Uh, so the idea is that as you're walking through each space, which has some sort of salience to you, you associate it with a foreign word. And what's been shown, and I'm sure Beth and some of our speakers tomorrow could talk to this, is that it does actually have a notable effect on your ability to recall those words later on. So that essentially, by switching from just 2D technology such as paper into more 3D version of things, uh, you actually have stronger recall of those words uh, as you try and find them later on. Another piece, <coughs> oops, there we go. Uh, another piece, again, not for everyone, that's been a massive help for me over the course of language learning is studying something called the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Because something that happens quite often, especially in a language like English, is that we have a bit of a nightmare of a writing system, right? English today is written to reflect the pronunciation of English in the 1300s or the 1400s, right? We have a million silent letters. We have all these bizarre vowel combinations. We have uh, any number of things that are quite perplexing for foreign language learners and for many of us that are native speakers. You find similar issues in many other world languages as well. Uh, one of the best ways to kind of break through that and to actually perfect and try and understand the way a foreign sound system works is to uh, see how it's reflected in the International Phonetic Alphabet, which is a system that's devised to have a specific symbol for each sound that can come out of the human mouth. So that essentially, if I were to say something like, <clears throat> let's see. So we have three words, right? Top, stop, and spot. So you might not know it, those three are all represented as T in your mind, but in fact, those are three separate T's. So in the word top, if you put your hand in front of your mouth, top, there's a little bit of a puff of air. On the other hand, if you say the word stop, that T sound sounds closer to a D. Separately, if you have spot, that T is actually never uh, open back up. It's not spot, it's spot. 
right? It's permanently closed. So those three different pronunciations of T are key to identifying someone as a native speaker, but they're certainly never going to be taught, at least not often, in an ESL class. And you can imagine the same thing is going on for foreign languages, where you know, even if the writing system seems pretty normal and standardized, you might actually find, oh, they actually have four different ways of pronouncing P that even native speakers don't realize. In any event, IPA is fantastic for that sort of thing, because it gives you that level of detail. OK. And uh, finally here, and I guess this is something that will probably have the most salience for you, is uh, being able to speak to native speakers. Now again, you will hear this to no end by any language educator that the number one way of learning a language is immersion. Now that's true, but it's not really helpful if most of us can't travel or don't have easy access, especially in the United States, to a wide and vibrant community of speakers, right? If you are in a rural part of the country, uh, it's, it's simply not a possibility. And again, even in high-density urban areas with many languages, it's still common to be able to go about your daily life and never hear or even use a foreign language. So again, some of the strategies that I found most effective here, one were simply going out and talking to people when I had that opportunity. This is an example from a documentary about me that was filmed in New York, where I used to go to coffee shops and they filmed me speaking in Arabic with one of the guys. Clearly kind of heady conversation. I'm not exactly sure what was going on here. But point being is you don't necessarily have to do this stuff in person, right? There's any number of options online that can open up the world of language learning to you. So whether that's uh, communities that arrange for meetups of language speakers, uh, sites like italki or Busu, which will uh, connect you with other language learners or other tutors from anywhere in the world, uh, Facebook groups where you can easily find communities of people studying everything from you know, Albanian to Zulu, uh, and separately, other kinds of systems, like, for example, this one I worked on, a little bit of shameless self-promotion, 3D Meet, where, uh, similarly, you can walk through virtual worlds and find native speakers who will talk to you or teach you any language you want. So again, uh, all of these apps are targeted or specialized to different demographics, but the beauty of the market is that there is something there basically for everyone, so that even if you're a shy learner, even if you're not super confident in your abilities, you can quite easily be exposed to authentic language and find someone who can be a conversational partner for you. OK, so now, I guess, to our conclusion, the meat of it is the big, so what? Why does all of this matter? I still don't get what the real importance is of learning a foreign language. That's quite fair. <laughs> So there's a couple things that I'd love to bring to your attention and that I'm sure you're going to hear uh, pretty extensively over the course of the next day of the symposium. So first is emerging research on the effects of uh, language on your executive functions and your cognition. So there's some great, if somewhat tentative, research that uh, bilingualism or high language ability might actually help you stave off dementia. There's also great research that has shown uh, that working memory is much more robust in many instances in children that have been raised bilingual than those who are monolingual. Uh, if anyone is interested, there's actually a, a great book on this from about 10 years ago by a linguist named Guy Deutscher called Through the Language Glass, in which he looks at the history of debates over how much language influences thought. And it's not the situation that, for example, your language will affect you know, your ability to understand time or your ability to do math or not, right? We all basically are born with the same set of executive uh, and cognitive abilities as human beings, but there are small things that might be influenced by your language, including your spatial memory and the parts of your brain that you use to do things like mathematical problems, right? There's some research that shows Chinese speakers might be using more spatial parts of their brains, and that's different than what English speakers do. Uh, another really fascinating instance of this uh, from The Economist a couple years ago is a highlight of a psychological study looking at uh, this example from moral philosophy called the trolley problem. Basic idea of the trolley problem as a thought experiment is that you see five people that are tied down to a train track, and there's a train that's chugging along and is about to run them over. You're standing up here, and there's a massive guy on top of this bridge, and if you push him over right in front of uh, those people, the train's going to hit and kill him, but it'll save those other five. So the basic question is, do you do it? It's pretty grim. Um, and what was found in this study was that uh, with a number of first language Korean and Japanese speakers, they found there was a pretty wide range of answers these people gave. Some of them did say immediately off the bat, of course I'd push the guy down. That's, you're going to sacrifice one life, but save five. That's an easy calculation. But that was not the majority of the answers there. 
the majority of people said things like, uh, well, maybe there's a way of pushing a button, or they, they tried basically weaseling their way out of having to deal with that moral issue, right? When you push a button, you can pull a lever or something, maybe the train will stop on its own. Or instead, there were some uh, people who simply said, no, I'm not going to commit a murder to save other people. I don't have any right to take that person's life. Point being, there's a pretty wide range of things when people were asked in their native language. What they found in the same study, though, was that when these Korean and Chinese speakers were asked in English, which was their second language, almost across the board, they said, yeah, push the guy over. <laughs> Suddenly, these people became, uh, if not downright sociopathic, perhaps a little bit more rationalizing, utilitarian, um, you know, maybe logically uh, driven to assess the situation, right? And that's pretty interesting, I would say. So the mere act of forcing these people to think through their decision in a non-native language affected their reasoning and their perspective on the situation. Now, I don't want to harp too much on this one specific issue because it's one study, you know, might as well be anecdotal for our purposes, but it does reflect a much wider phenomenon, which is that speaking in a second language, because it comes with, uh, you know, different connotations, different personal feelings and memories, and of course, different levels of cognitive focus, right? It doesn't come as easily to you as your native language. It might have an effect on the way that you work through problems, on the way that you see situations like the trolley problem, or how to deal with someone interpersonally, or how to get what you want out of another person, right? That sheer act of forcing you to use a system that you're not entirely native in or comfortable with looks like it actually might affect uh, your outward behavior on the world. And if you want to take that one step further, I think what this really says is that being in a foreign language forces you to put yourself in a different pair of shoes, for better, or perhaps in this case, for the worse. Separately, and again, something that of course will be on everybody's mind, is the abilities that language will give you on the job market, right? It's no secret, obviously, that English has uh, predominance in today's global economy, but the reality is that speaking a foreign language to an intermediate or fluent level can have tangible effects on your prospects in the job market. Uh, recent poll, for example, uh, sorry, recent piece of research that was conducted by The Economist uh, found that on average, at least in the United States, people with second language uh, capabilities, especially for higher desired languages like uh, Spanish and Chinese, had, uh, depending on the state, between 5 and 20 percent uh, higher per hour salaries than did monolinguals. And the way this math works out on average in the United States is that lifetime earnings, and this is just on average, for someone that has fluency and work capabilities in a foreign language might be around $67,000 over the course of one's lifetime, which intuitively makes sense, right? Even if you're not working as uh, a language instructor or a translator, right? Knowing a language like Spanish opens you up to any number of freelancing opportunities, let's say, in the Spanish-speaking world, or the ability to travel to places and work there. Um, again, it's, it's simply broadening your capability and your prospects in the job market. It's, it's nothing, um, you know, particularly revolutionary, but those numbers do need to be hit home that by only speaking English, you are in some ways at a disadvantage if you're trying to find as wide a number of opportunities as possible. Another important thing when it comes to foreign languages, of course, is that there's a fair amount of both anecdotal and uh, somewhat objective research that shows that having strong language capabilities can often translate into a better uh, capability when it comes to coding, which of course unlocks much higher salaries for many people as well as more work opportunities. So across the board, it seems pretty clear that having foreign language capabilities really does make you a competitive candidate in today's job market. Okay, and then final piece of information I just wanted to distill here is that Language learning as well, outside of the economic gains, outside of the cognitive gains, I would argue makes you a better global citizen. Someone that is ready to reach across borders, understand foreign cultures, and understand the value that language brings us as human beings and as communities. Now something here I just want to bring your attention to, many people don't know about this, is that in the world today, there are approximately 7,000 languages, depending again on how you define a language versus a dialect. Um, unfortunately, it looks like over half of those languages are going to die out, become fully extinct within the next 80 or so years. And that's just the sheer reality of what uh, the modern economy does to small minority languages that don't have the resources to compete at the national or international level. 
So you can see it, for example, in the United States, where we really only have three or four Native American languages that are still spoken vibrantly with speaker communities over 100,000. For the most part, many reservations across the United States, languages are on their way out. They only have a handful of native speakers, and most of them are above 60 or 70. You see this too with minority languages everywhere. So in that example earlier, for example, in, in India or in Nigeria, where you have 400 plus languages, uh, many of them simply have no use and have no support at the government level. They're not spoken in schools. They're many times not even respected within their own communities. They're seen as a sign of lack of education or just kind of uh, barbarism. And it's seen instead like speaking you know, the main language, which might be English or Hindi or Russian or whatever it is, uh, is something that is much more valuable. And so we have to ask ourselves a question of what is lost, basically, when our languages die out or when we're forced to shift to another community's language in order to compete. You might think, well, that's just the way the world goes, and that's true, unfortunately, to a certain degree, but it doesn't have to be this way. So you have to imagine, and you think for a second, what would happen if English went extinct overnight, right? If we lost Shakespeare, the Beatles, <laughs> the Bible, the King James Bible, really anything you can think of, all of that emotion, all of that cultural knowledge, all that world of references and mythologies and puns and wordplay and word histories all suddenly went extinct. This is something that's happening uh, almost at the rate of once every two weeks. That's the average time it takes for uh, smaller languages to die out these days. So we're quite literally losing 20 plus languages per year, and with each of them goes uh, another piece of the human story and another distinct worldview. Now again, brushing up on your Spanish or learning a little bit of Mandarin is not gonna help this situation, but this should put things into perspective of what a language really means at the communal level, at the social level, and at the emotional level. And I think the best person who encapsulates that idea is, of course, Nelson Mandela, who quite famously once said, when you talk to a man in a language understands, he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. Speaking a foreign language fundamentally gives you a bridge to another person's emotions and experiences, and it's something that truly bright, uh, broadens your worldview no matter which angle you look at it from. So we've talked a little bit about the job market, we've talked <coughs> about the cognitive side of things, um, we, of course, can talk a bit more about the educational side of things, but no matter how you see it, bringing on a foreign language not only helps you in your own personal development, but I would argue makes you a much better global citizen. And with that, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, I am all yours. Yes, sir. Um, so I use about four or five for work every day. Uh, so that's Arabic, Persian, French, German, a little bit of Turkish. Uh, and I would say there's about another 10 that I could read a newspaper in or have a basic conversation in. But it really is a case of if you don't use it, you lose it. Right, uh, you were having this conversation actually at dinner earlier. You know, uh, maybe the solution to our problems is just if we had more language participation in schools, and that's obviously a good start. On the other hand, like, look, I took calculus in high school, allegedly. I apparently did well in it. I could not tell you what a differential equation is, right? It is the fact that, look, even if you're very good in a certain skill set, uh, if you're not putting it to use and actively integrating it into your daily life and getting some sort of entertainment out of it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So, um, you know, it is the sort of thing where it's definitely an uphill battle or it's like mowing the lawn. You got to do it next week or, you know, it's completely useless. But uh, I would say at least I've been able to keep up in, yeah, four to five pretty regularly. And then some dead ones on the side, just as a weird hobby. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I love most about ancient languages is getting a view into not only the way that societies function, but also just like what day-to-day -day life looked like in the ancient world. Like, I remember as one example, uh, in my class in undergrad where we were studying um, Akkadian, which is kind of the successor language to Sumerian, was spoken all throughout Iraq and what's today Iraq and the ancient Middle East. Um, 
because these records are baked into clay tablets, they've essentially all survived, right? It doesn't dissolve like paper does or like animal skins do. So we really basically have the entire gamut of everyday life that was written down from the ancient Middle East, you know, four or 5,000 years ago. So that's everything from diaries to court records to economic documents to medical texts and all this other stuff. And I remember it really did uh, hit home for me one day. We were reading, I think it was the minutes of a legal court case from a Sunday in April 1737 BC. Down to that level of precision, where a guy was being tried for having an affair with his neighbor's wife, and his legal argument was that she came on to me first. So again, people really don't change. You know, you see the same thing too, that you know, people writing in 2500 BC complaining about, oh, their kids are speaking this ridiculous slang these days, or they have these really bizarre ways of dressing, right? Those things, again, really do not change. Uh, we even have, and this I think is the funniest, customer, uh, customer service complaints from about 1800 BC of guys complaining, look, I talked to your representative, he gave me a bunch of copper bars, this is not the quality you promised me, how are you gonna refund me? Right, you're gonna give me a, a company credit? What are you gonna do here? And again, to see this all projected back into a time of the world that we tend to think of as, probably rightly, kind of barbarous, um, in many ways unenlightened, uneducated, right? Mores and values were entirely different. Murder was widespread. Uh, any number of behaviors, basically, that we would be horrified by today were part of everyday life back then. But despite those differences in time, we can also see a kind of shared humanity in everyday text, despite the thousands of years and however many number of experiences separate us from these people living back in the Bronze Age. So that's just one small example, but that's something that absolutely blows my mind whenever I see it in, you know, in an ancient text or something older. Yeah. Yeah. advising an English student who spent a year in the United States studying. Yeah. And all she ever did was relate with the uh, college student here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And I was now advising her on further studies. She was back in Indonesia. She was speaking to me using words, F words, S words. <laughs> and she had no conception when she talked to her professor you should speak in a different way than you talk to your peers. Right. And that's just an example in the other direction. Yeah. The Javanese had seven levels of uh, language to speak up to God at the seventh level. Mm. But, I mean, like A1, B, A2, B1, B2 level. Yeah. But I don't think they address the cultural sensitivity. That's very true, right? And, and that's a great point there that just having linguistic capability doesn't immediately translate into an ability to function in a foreign society and to operate based off of the values and mores of that culture. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you there. My take instead, though, is that obviously learning a language does give you an initial foot in the door than just being a, an English speaker who's only able to interact with people as they're speaking English back to you. You know, so that's, that's essentially the takeaway here, that having a language opens you up to opportunities, and you know, let's say out of a group of 100 people, maybe 50 take it further, and are able to get to a level of really having a deep understanding of local religions, or what politeness looks like. Um, you know, in some languages, to be fair, that, those levels of politeness are in fact embedded into grammatical structures. So as one example, Japanese has multiple different kinds of verb tenses, depending on if you're talking to a subordinate, a friend who's obviously at your social level, a superior, an elderly person, or the emperor, <laughs> right? There really is a tense in Japanese specifically for talking to, to royalty. Um, again, and, and those sorts of things, that's where it really comes down to not only your own I guess, drive as a language learner, but also a highly competent teacher. So this is the other side of the language education puzzle, is having teachers that are there to really instruct you, not only in just what conjugations look like or whatever else, but also how do these societies function, right? And why is it that you should not be using the F word to your professor? <laughs> Um, so I am 
I, first of all, I, my like, politically correct answer is that all of them are beautiful and all of them have their own yada, 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 yada. That's true, <laughs> comma, but. Um, now, I am particularly partial to the languages uh, from the part of the world that I work on the most, which is the Middle East. So primarily Arabic and Persian. Um, definitely very difficult languages, but extremely rewarding in terms of what they give you access to, right? So obviously, if you know Arabic well enough, you can get a much better sense of uh, the Quran, of the Islamic religion, which in turn gives you a window into the lives of over a billion people across the world, not just in the Arabic-speaking world, but Indonesia, South Asia, Africa, wherever else. Um, additionally, Persian for me always has a special place in my heart, not only because of some of the amazing interactions that I've had with Iranians, who I think honestly are some of the world's most hospitable and warm people, um, but also because of, for example, the access that it gives you to really beautiful poetry. Um, but again, that's very, that's subjective, right? That's tied to my own personal experiences, and I'm sure every one of you in the audience can make an argument for why Spanish or German or whatever it is, uh, is in fact the greatest language in the world. Yeah. Yeah, um, the one really famous example of this comes from uh, Nikita Khrushchev when he gave a speech. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev was a Soviet premier in the 1960s, uh, who was premier during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, gave a speech at the UN, I think in 63 or maybe 62, right before he was kicked out of office, um, in which he very famously banged his shoe on the podium and screamed out in Russian, "Muy vas pachoronim," which was translated in the English media as uh, "We'll bury you." We're gonna bury you. Which then sparked this complete panic in the US media of this guy is out here banging his foot on the podium like a madman, he's threatening nuclear war, they're gonna bury us. What Muvas Pajoronium actually means is we're gonna outlast you. And that is much more in line with the ideology at the time, which is communism is on the ascendancy, capitalism is a decrepit and decaying system, and we're going to outlast you by being, being the better man, right? By being the stronger system. So a little bit less dramatic, wasn't exactly threatening war, but again, you can see there how <laughs> different interpretations definitely can inform the way that uh, politicians are going to the negotiating table. Um, there's another example like this, I've forgotten the exact word, but uh, Harry Truman, directly before making the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, gave, uh, I think it was a 48-hour ultimatum to the Japanese government uh, asking for their immediate surrender. And they responded with a word which I'm blanking on right now, a little bit vague in meaning, but was approximately the equivalent of, uh, we're not gonna answer because we don't have a response. And instead, it was translated in the English-speaking media as, we're spurning your response, piss off. Um, not to say, obviously, that Truman would not have dropped the bomb had we just had better translators, but the uh, point there, essentially, is that it did uh, inform the exact time and shape of negotiations as they moved on. Maybe had there been better communication, there could have been uh, you know, some time in between in which there may have been a point, you know, opportunity for detente between Japan and the United States. That's speculative, but at least at the high level you do see those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to other instances, at least from modern level, um, hmm. I mean, in a very grim sense, uh, what we see, for example, with companies like Nike, which, whose uh, supply chains, especially for things like cotton, are highly exposed and intertwined with slave labor, uh, particularly in the Xinjiang region of China, right? Cot cotton that ultimately ends up in Nike products is, uh, at least in some instances, made in slave labor camps. Um, what Nike says to the US market is entirely different from what they say to the Chinese market. So when this was first uh, in the media about a year ago, Nike's CEO made a big statement in English language media that we're horrified by this, we're gonna look into it, we don't uh, accept slavery in any form, and uh, we will absolutely cut off our ties with any companies that are exposed to that. Um, their statement in the Chinese media was, uh, we reject this, there's no slave labor in China, and um, we're proud to do business here. <laughs> so these kind of things do, quite often uh, get used for pretty nefarious purposes. Anyway, just some thoughts off the top of my head. 
And again, if you were not a Chinese speaker, you would not have been exposed to that or seen that. Yeah. 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 It's always a tough one, right? And it, it in my sense at least, again, watching this from the outside, is that um, you know, some of the things in the United States that keep language communities vibrant and keep them going is a strong sense of communal pride and solidarity, right? So I think one of the reasons, among others, that Spanish uh, has so successfully been passed on generation to generation as opposed to dying out the way that it did with, for example, Italian immigrants or Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants or the Irish or whatever else, um, is not only the very large number of speakers that are continuously you know, replenishing that community, but also a new sense that speaking Spanish is a key part of Hispanic and Latino identity, right? And that it's, at least these days, thankfully, it's, it's seen now as a benefit rather than something that is you know, barbaric or needs to be thrown aside, whatever. Obviously, there's you know, cultural barriers that still need to be overcome, but um, in any event, what I'm getting to there is that I think being able to seek out people who are like-minded and who are, uh, I think, equally motivated and passionate about bringing their language back and about being able to communicate and reach out to this world is the best way to go about things. So, of course, there's plenty of you can do on your own, whether that's, again, absorbing media, watching movies, podcasts, whatever else that might bring you up to a good level and a good level of cu cultural knowledge that you can just do on your own. But I think having that community is really an important thing, right? Because having sort of vibrant social interactions and emotional connections is what makes language language, right? It's something that is, among other things, not only used to express yourself, but to connect you to others and make you understand others. Um, so again, when it comes to actually how do you create those kinds of communities, right? Whether it's in person or online spaces, uh, that really comes down, again, to a case-by-case -case basis and what organizing looks like, what your community looks like. But that's my broad take. I'm sorry, I can't can I be more helpful there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, yeah. And again, you know, there, I, I think to your point, right, it's certainly one thing if the United States government says, great, we'd like to have Spanish in a lot of schools, but that doesn't necessarily break down the barriers at, you know, the social level of people saying, you know, for example, we don't want to hear people speaking Spanish here, et cetera. And that sort of change, I think, as you've said, really does need to come through, um, at least in my opinion, you know, more personal awareness, more popularization of language learning as a hobby or just literally general awareness of like the cool things that language can do. And I think that in many ways is the responsibility of linguists and of language educators and of people that are just generally interested in, in foreign languages or foreign cultures. But of course that kind of grassroots change is easier said than done. It's two steps forward, one step back. Um, but it absolutely should be at, at the front of our minds. Yeah, good point. Yeah.
So what I think you're getting to is a bigger question about can uh, large societies tolerate difference, right? If we were to take this to a slightly broader level, what you're saying essentially is, look, if you have a modern day nation state in which uh, government and society writ large is trying to impose a unified way of thinking or at least a common base for everybody to have in terms of education and morals and shared values and whatever else, um, should it be okay in those societies to have people who are coming from a different background who might not agree with what the mainstream ideology is, so to speak, or just instead do agree with mainstream ideology but also want to retain their level of difference, whether that's at the linguistic level, the religious level, the ethnic level, um, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and I would say there's no reason that having diversity and having people of different backgrounds is the Achilles heel of a large society, right? I think having diversity uh, instead really increases our ability as a society not only to be empathetic and more cultured, but also I think does give us a stronger sense of community at the end of the day, and that we can appreciate that, look, even though uh, we have people that are coming from all over the world, we can all come together and help build our communities and make them stronger. Um, when it comes down to the level of language, I think that's really how it needs to be seen, that having a language spoken like, you know, Lakota Sioux or uh, Mandarin or Vietnamese or whatever else in American communities is not a threat to English. The same way in China, realistically, the fact that people speak Cantonese or Min or Hakka or Uyghur or whatever it is, uh, they, they don't threaten the existence of the Chinese nation. Um, you know, and that's something that really needs to be, how do I say this? Um, you know, it's that level of diversity. <coughs> hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question, right? It, this happens in the United States, of course, too. Yeah. 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 Right, so from an economic perspective, right, if you're taking the, um, let's say, morality or the perfect, you know, best case scenario out of it, probably, and that is the trade-off that those people make every day, right? My home language, which is spoken by, you know, 100 people in this village, is not going to help me out in life, and I don't really want to be educated in it at school because what I really need to be successful in this economy is Hindi or English or whatever else, right? If you're just speaking from a purely and kind of cruel, like, utilitarian perspective, that, unfortunately, is the situation, the calculation that many people are forced through. What I would say, on the other hand, though, is that there's no reason that languages can't coexist, right? And that, in fact, is the situation in places like China, in India, in Nigeria, et cetera, where it actually is quite common to have your village language, your school language, your language that you use in the government or in the capital city, and these things exist uh, more or less harmoniously, right? Of course, there is discrimination in any number of instances, primarily coming from the government level down to the communal level. Um, but there's nothing intrinsic to having multiple languages that means a society is destined to fail. I guess that's what I'm saying here, right? That we can have a balance between a lingua franca, right? A commonly used language that allows us all to communicate with one another uh, without having to sacrifice our own cultures and ways of speaking. But again, that's, you know, unfortunately not reflective of what is happening in many parts of the world. Um, and I think, you know, without better organizing and without, you know, more awareness out there, unfortunately, this is the direction that we are heading in. 
where everything is converging on having a single language or a handful of very large dominant languages in these extremely diverse societies. And I think that in many ways is a tragedy. So I hate, I hate to interrupt all these wonderful questions and fruitful conversation, but um, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time since we will be back here in about 13 hours um, to continue, hopefully, this conversation at 9.30 a.m. with Dr. Naya Firyan Ramirez and at 10.30 with Dr. Ken Patowski. So we hope you can join us then, and thank you very much for coming and joining online as well. One last thank you to Tim for that wonderful, inspiring message.